what every Adventist scientist should know, genetic entropy. We've been doing a series on what every Adventist scientist should know. We discussed the philosophy of science for our very first topic. We've been going through the question of is there a God and genetic entropy is the last one of that series. Um, we've also gone through most of how old is life on Earth and uh, we have one more paleocurrence which we should be doing in a couple of weeks. Um, next week we'll be talking about some of the challenges to young life creationism and specifically the Yellowstone Fossil Forest by uh, a person who is there. And um, then we'll have a few things about Adventist health messages. Now this isn't all there is to uh, what every Adventist scientist should know, but it's probably a pretty decent core. So let's go to genetic entropy. First, I'm going to give you the references for most of them. and. Uh, most of the rest of them can be found in uh, the first uh, reference. Uh, I'm going to discuss the fact that there are about 100 mutations per human generation, that most of them are deleterious, that natural selection simply is incapable of getting rid of all of them, and that therefore the genome just simply can't last millions of years. That's the human genome, that's us. Also elephants, any large mammals, any large animal that, that um, takes years to produce young, particularly ones that produce young, one or two or three at a time. And then we're going to discuss some objections that have been raised. And then I'll give you kind of my short summary and then you get to make your comments and questions. References. Um, probably the key first reference is uh, uh, John Sanford's book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. And there are two editions in case you're interested. Um, I don't think it's available online at this point. Um, at least uh, I couldn't find anything where it was, you know, for Kindle or so forth. The rest of these, if I could find something for, uh, online, I put them in. Uh, Kimura, 1979, uh, the model of effective neutral mutations in which selection constraint is incorporated, and that's in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and all of their stuff is online, so you can get that if you want to. Uh, Garish and Lenski in 1998, the fate of competing beneficial mutations in an asexual population, and you can get that online, but you have to go through kind of a circuitous route. Uh, if, you, if you Google this on Google Scholar, it'll have available at researchgate.net and you can click it, but I couldn't find an actual uh, uh, website for it. So what you have to do is click that and, uh, and then it'll download the PDF for you without ever, you know, just it's a flat out download. Um, Kandushav, 1995, Contamination of the Genome by Very Slightly Deleterious Mutations. And he asked the question, why have we not died a hundred times over? Because that's what the math would expect, lead you to expect if you believe in long ages. And that's in the Journal of Theor Theoretical Biology and I couldn't find that one online. So you probably have to go to a library somewhere uh, that carries the Journal of Theoretical Biology. Uh, Kondrashov, 2002, direct estimate of human per nucleotide mutation rates at 20 loci. This uh, gives us an idea of how many mutations there actually are. Um, and uh, that one again is not online. Well, actually, it is online if you want to pay. Uh, what the uh, company wants to charge you, which is basically the price of a whole issue. Um, Nachman and Kroll, 2000, that one is available online. Estimate of the mutation rate per nucleotide in humans in genetics. 
And you notice the other one was Genetica, and they're different. Uh, Lynch, uh, 2010, Rate, Molecular Spectrum, and Consequences of Human Mutation, again in PNAS. Kodali, Singh, and Alani, Genomic Mutation Rates. Um, so you notice these are all peer-reviewed articles. This is not some fly-by-night thing. It's not a, something that made up by some creationist specifically for this point. Uh, John Sanford is a world-class geneticist. Invented the gene gun, among other things. So, how many mutations are there? Well, there are about 100 mutations per generation in human. And if you have kids, there are 100, generations worse off, 100 mutations worse off than you are. If you have grandkids, they're 200 mutations worse off. Mm, maybe 90, maybe 70, maybe 120, you know, depends on how it rounds out. But that's the pretty much average figure as far as we can tell. Estimates in, um, in Sanford are 100 to 300. I was able to find one that had 70. That's the lowest I've found in the literature. We'll go in, uh, into that in just a minute. 300 is actually a personal communication by one of the geneticists that he knows and has worked with. That's the one that didn't get into the literature itself. Pardon me? suggest 60? In that family study? Well, we're going to get to that. Um, 100 is Kondrashov 2002, the reference that we gave. 175 is Nachman and Kroll. Uh, there are some newer estimates. Uh, 70 in Roach, JC et al. I just went back to it and looked at it. And um, so, you know, and probably it varies from human to human depending on what kind of stuff you eat. You get a lot of um, nitrites in your food, you probably have more. You get a lot of antioxidants, you probably have less. So, you know, those of you who are going to have kids, have some fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> But it's, it's in the range of 100. And uh, here's some other numbers. That, what's interesting is that when Sue et al. studied the Y chromosome, uh, the reference, um, oh my, I forgot to put that in. Uh, they actually found that the Y chromosome had a higher mutation rate than the rest of the uh, genome. Um, I don't know. But uh, you'll notice that it's almost double what, uh, well, actually it's triple what that one is. Uh, just, uh, just, you, just a minute, we have a biochemist here to comment. The, re the reason for that is because one of the repair mechanisms uh, relies on recombination. <laughs> we call it recombinant repair mechanism, which means when there is a damage on one chromosome, they go over it, to the other chromosome? Yes, the repair mechanism takes <laughs> advantage of the information from the counterpart chromosome to repair the damaged one. So what you're but saying is we actually have not only a backup, but we have a backup of our backup. Oh, yes. We have many layers of contingency repair mechanisms. So the Y chromosome doesn't have the extra backup, so it can't repair itself quite as well. Um, uh, in Lynch, in 2008, he started looking at yeast, and it's very interesting. The yeast direct measurement is 0 0.33.008 plus or minus 10 to the ninth. Let's go back here and look at this other one. You'll notice that these are uh, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 8, so it's quite a bit higher in humans than it is in yeast for whatever reason. I think that the reason is because there are several generations between the germline of one person and the germline of the next, whereas the yeast, you're getting it per cell division. So you, this, is, uh, this is a cumulative thing. But this is yeast. Uh, microsatellites are much higher. 
If you have a small number of repeats, it's it's you'll notice that it's a hundred times as high. Well, no, I say the what three thousand times as high, two thousand times as high, and uh, and if it's twenty to twenty-four repeats, a little longer, it's even worse. And 31 to 36 repeats, you can see it's still in, it's, it's getting worse the longer the microsatellite is, the worse it is, apparently. At least that's the data we have. And in the, it doesn't matter too much, you know, here's um, uh, right. the yeast, there's a worm, there's a fruit fly, and there's their number for humans. But this number is quite a bit lower than the number you've seen before. That's because there are several generations of cells that have to divide before you can get egg and sperm from the original fertilized egg. So we are losing our information. How many perfect kids do you have to do? Since this is a Poisson distribution, which is basically a fancy binomial with one end cut off, or what, with one end stopped at zero and the other end going on to infinity. Um, the number of mutations, uh, number of uh, offspring with zero mutations is e to the minus lambda, where lambda is the average number of mutations, and e is 2.718281828, and it goes on, and it doesn't keep repeating. Um, for an average of three mutations, e to the minus three is about one in 20. That means that if you're gonna have a kid that doesn't have any mutations at all, and your average is three, not 100, three, you have to have 20 kids just to make it even. Well, actually, you have to have 40 kids, you have to have 20 boys and 20 girls. I don't think most women are up to that. <laughs> um, a family would have to have 40 children. Now, you'd think, well, what about miscarriages? But remember, the, the, the mutation rate is being measured not on all fertilized eggs. It's been measure, being measured on the fertilized eggs that actually make it to adulthood or at least to childhood uh, where, they're, where they're living nicely. And so that means that, uh, well, maybe the older children don't count, but these days there aren't too many that die in older childhood. Um, the miscarriages don't count. If you, were to do the, if you were to put the miscarriages in, you'd probably find that the mutation rate's even higher because most miscarriages do have, in fact, major mutations, and that's why they don't make it. So, if you now, this is what happens to those numbers. For three children, uh, three mutations, you have to have forty children to get zero mutations. Go ahead. You know of any figures on uh, what percentage or miscarriage? Is there any idea? The reported miscarriage, which is of course an underestimate. Yeah, no, I want real miscarriage. Is like twenty-five percent. And the the number of detectable mutations is like 90% of miscarriages. And of course that doesn't count the ones that were too small that were lost um, somewhere and they didn't even analyze them. The numbers are not really hard but it gives you some kind of an idea of how bad things are. For an average of six mutations you're going to have 400 kids, which means, of course, 800 kids, boys and 800, uh, 400 boys and 400 girls. In other words, it's not going to happen. Now, if you're a fruit fly, maybe so. But if you're human, this is, um, as they would say, humanly impossible. And the same thing is true if you're an elephant. Well, you can imagine if you have an average of 100, even if you have an average of 70, even if you have an average of 60, 
it's going to be, it just isn't going to happen. All the kids are going to be worse off than their parents. Now here in America, we like to think that uh, all the kids will do better than their parents. And of course, there is some truth to the fact that environment has a great deal to do with what's going on. But the genetics, we're losing ground. The best, now, how many harmful mutations are there? This is the interesting thing. The best estimate of the ratio of beneficial to deleterious mutations is one in a million. Yeah, that's in the literature. In fact, it's so low that it actually hasn't been measured. This is a, what that means is they can say with reasonable confidence that it's probably, uh, probably higher than that, but they don't know exactly how high. Do even beneficial mutations still exist? Well, they have to eventually because if somebody had a deleterious mutation and they mutated it back to the normal, then of course that by definition would be a beneficial mutation. But certainly towards giving us great brains, big eyes, um, the ability to think better, nah. At least we don't know about it if it's there. Maybe we're missing something and maybe it's really one in a thousand, but that means that 999 of them are bad. Which means that if your kids have got it, let's say one in a thousand, and let's say it's a hundred mutation, that means one in ten kids gets a beneficial mutation on top of the 99 other deleterious mutations. And the other ones, it's all deleterious. Simple math. <coughs> but and Kimura in 1979 drew a very interesting graph. Uh, you might expect that, you know, some mutations are beneficial and some are, and, and it's kind of, there's a normal distribution, right? Well, actually, it's more like kind of truncated. Well, here's what it really looks like, according to Kimura. Um, this is actually from Kimura's article, and you'll notice that it's a kind of a quasi uh, 1 over x squared curve or something like that. Um, and you'll notice also that most of those mutations can't even be selected for. They are so minimally deleterious that they're not, they're not enough to actually select against. So natural selection is totally blind to them. Not only are we deteriorating, but natural selection can't touch it. Um, this is a redraw from um, uh, Sanford of, of Kimura's distribution. And you can see there's one thing that he would correct. He would put that there's a little tiny bit of beneficial mutations. But they're also close and also they're not selectable. So if we do have good mutations, there's no way of making them stick. Then the general drift with time is going to be downhill. Now, this is important also. It isn't just a matter that, um, that the mutations are there and they're hard to select, but there's also a bunch of noise. Some things happen to people that don't have anything to do with their genetics. You know, people go to war and some of them get shot and it's not just all in the genes. And the more noise you have of that kind, the bigger the box of mutations that are unselectable. And putting more pressure on it doesn't do any good unless you can put more pressure on the specific ones that you want selected. You just kill more people, that's all. Low signal to noise ratios make genes basically unselectable. So what really happens is that the, that the box that you saw goes out from here to here to here. Now, of course, to be fair, we're drawing a box 
where what it really is is kind of a shading in. That, it's, that is, there's a little bit of selectivity and more as you get further out. But you can see that if the box gets wide enough, natural selection won't even try, let alone do anything. Well, that's probably not true. I mean, if you have uh, two chromosome 18s, you're not going to have kids, just period, if it's that bad. So there is some selection way out on the tail, but there's not very much. Well, can natural selection fix this? Well, you've already seen the problems that we're having. Natural selection can only be as powerful as the number of offspring minus replacements. That is to say, if you are having 2.3 kids, which is now the average American family, you can't you can only use that 0.3 kids to select. Because if you select more than that, the population goes down. Now, if you have four kids, and only two of them survive, that means the natural selection is 50%. If natural selection gets over 50%, then you lose your population. If you're like in Europe where they're having 1 1.3 kids, 1.7 kids, you actually can't afford any natural selection at all. We have a comment way back up. I'm sorry, even the You have to have a growing population in order to have selection, or at least you have to have a, that many more offspring. Because if you do, it, if you apply natural selection to a shrinking population, you just make it go extinct faster. It's already shrinking. It's not going to expand by natural selection. Yeah. The only way you can do natural selection is if you have excess population that you can afford to lose. See, if, if, if you're spiraling down, then natural selection makes it worse. If you have condors and they're only putting out 1.7 eggs per couple uh, during their lifetime, you know, because of whatever, then if somebody starts shooting the condors, they start dying faster. Even if you're crack shot is somebody that knows that this one has thyroid disease and needs to go down. It's tough. So, a truncation, which is either can be done by killing them or by making sure they don't have any kids, and it doesn't really matter which one, uh, is the maximum strength of natural selection. That is to say, you say that Rather than saying these people can have five kids, these people can have two kids, these people can have one kid, these people can't have any, you just say, okay, we're only going to let the five kid people go. Oh, maybe the five kid and the two kid people. Um, and anybody less than that, they get none. That's maximum selection pressure. Well, what happens? See, you can kill them or you can stop them from reproducing. It doesn't matter which. Um, but naturally, what happens if you have a whole bunch of, of mutations that you're trying to select against? Well, then you have to spread that over all of those. In other words, the, if you have 100 mutations, each, let's say you, uh, you, let's say you have the luxury of 50% selection pressure that you can afford to spend. And if you have 100 mutations, you can only afford to select each mutation at a one uh, half of 1%. Either that or you're going to have to concentrate all of them or uh, concentrate most of them on a few really bad mutations and you're going to have to let the other ones go free. You see, Natural selection is not a panacea that can just fix everything. 
It is limited in its power. And it's limited by how much excess population you have. And if you don't have any, you can't use it. And if there are too many things you've got to spend it on, each one doesn't get enough spending on it. Uh, low heritability means that selecting away bad phenotypes does very little to eliminate bad genotypes. What that means is if you have two people that look almost identical, you can't judge between them. So you can't do the selecting that would allow you to say, well, no, I don't want that mutation. So you get, you get some kid who is got, um, let's say, relatively poor genetic ability, but the parents really work hard with the kid, and the kid learns well and uh, doesn't do things that are damaging and turns out pretty much okay. You have another kid who has better raw genetic material, but the parents either don't parent them well or perhaps don't know how to parent them well. And the kid you know, runs right and has better genetics, but has poorer environment. And the, the addition of the, the, the two things don't balance out to where the kid with the better uh, genome actually is the worst kid. And then you apply selection. You, uh, you select the best one. Well, you select the one that actually has the worst genome. You can do that. Because selection doesn't look at the genome. Nobody goes through and says, oh, there's just too many A switched to T's. You know, you're out of here. We look at the whole package, and the whole package has to do with environment as well as genetics. And there are all kinds of reasons for phenotype variation, most of which don't have anything to do with genetics. For example, there's environmental. Let's supposing you wanted to select people for a basketball team. Okay, so you want them tall most of the time. You want them fast and so forth. <coughs> um, well, you have some skinny little runt that uh, didn't get food when he was a kid and just his growth spurt didn't go as high. Perfectly good genetics, but he fails, he gets a bad environment, and he's going to fail the basketball team test. And so if your goal is to create people who are all tall, he loses out. And what that means is that he's being judged on what he is in toto, not in what his genetics are. And his genetics may very well be very good genetics. And if you just feed him a little more, this happened, by the way, in Vietnam. It's happening in, in Japan. The kids are all growing taller than their parents. And their genetics are worse. We know that. But their environment is so much better that they're now growing bigger. Well, what would have happened if we had, you know, uh, went through and said, okay, all Japanese males below, let's say, five foot eight in height get killed? <coughs> we probably killed them all off. Now, lest Europeans think they're any better than that, go back and look at the Middle Ages and look at the suits of armor. Five, two. Bedrooms in museums. Bedrooms in where? Museums. Museums? museums? Yeah. yeah. It, so. All the beds look short. I'm thinking, what is this? Is this for some kids or something? Well, they're, they're, <laughs> they're short people. People used to be shorter. And it doesn't have to do with heredity. It has to do with environment. So if you're judging people by their size, you're not just judging heredity. You're also judging environment. And at that point, you're not selecting for mm -hmm. height. Now, of course, height's only one thing. You'd like brains. You'd like muscle. You'd like, I don't know, women to have nice shapes to them. Uh, all kinds of stuff. But, um, but you can't select for all of that at the same time. And that's the problem. That's one of the problems. But the other problem is, you know, how, 
how a person acts in certain situations has partly to do with their genetics, but also partly to do with their training. You give two people who are, let's say, fighting, and let's say that if you want people to be able to defend themselves, and, um, and one of them knows karate and one doesn't. Well, the karate person will probably win, but does that have anything to do with genetics? No. <coughs> And so that's the problem. You have an environmental, and then you have what you can call the environmental genotype interaction, which might be, um, you know, some people will grow taller than others, but at the same time, it's partly genetic, it's partly environment. Um, there's non-hereditable genetic variations, such as uh, epigenetics, epistasis, dominance. Um, people have a dominant gene, it doesn't... Uh, but uh, you, if you have two of those genes, you're in big trouble. Um, homeostatic processes, that is to say the body has a remarkable way of trying to make everything come out right, even when there's a few flaws in the genetics. And so then the, the, the person looks perfectly good, but they actually are missing some genes, or missing having genes that don't work quite uh, optimally. There's a cyclic selection. Maybe you want them tall at one point and then you want them short at some other point. Or maybe you want them a little more obese at one point and then a little less obese at another point. Yes, and you can select for those kinds of things. You see, tall people stick out and they might be a threat to the ruler, so we're going to take all the tall people out. Mm -hmm. And then the next person wants everybody tall. Well, when you start doing cyclic selection like that, it doesn't get you anywhere. It's wasted selection in terms of trying to get what you're, what you're looking for. Heritable genetic vari variation is only about 0.4%. So if we put it on a graph, 99.6% of selection is wasted. So what that means is that if you buy those figures, and I think they're reasonable ones, that we started out with 50% selection, now we're at 0.2% selection. That's all you, you can take out and actually make it influence the genome. Oh, if you really want to, you can say, well, maybe half of this. <coughs> but you're still reducing it by 25%. That wonderful natural selection that was going to get you everywhere is not powerful enough. It's simply too wasteful. Well, what is happening to the genome? All the evidence that we have points to human genetic degradation. Under the most optimistic and unreasonable projection, human fitness is degenerating. Fitness, we're talking about reproductive fitness at this point, is degenerating about 1% to 2% per generation. <coughs> of course, the environment has a lot to do with that too, but the genetics are, we're losing. Biologists have argued that natural selection can reverse this, but as you can see, natural selection isn't nearly as powerful as people would like it to be. Genetic em entropy appears to be too strong. It's able to overpower natural selection. This, uh, I think, is an important point that uh, John Sanford brings out. Genetic entropy is not a starting axiomatic position. This is not something we start with and we say, aha, this is the way it is. It is actually a logical conclusion derived from careful analysis of how selection really operates. You're forced into this by the facts. Why have we not died a hundred times over? When Sanford was young, he realized that we all die. But he was taught that there was still one hope. The world is getting better. Evolution would, you know, help us up because natural selection would get things better and better. And maybe if we work hard enough, it, we can actually make it to where we don't have to die. You know, research and we'll just, we'll get there. But, uh, uh, and, and Kamura expressed this hope in 1976. Shall we be content to preserve ourselves as a superb example of living fossils in the, on this tiny speck of the universe? Or shall we try with all our might to improve ourselves to become supermen? 
to, st and to still higher forms, to expand into the wider part of the, part of the universe, and to show that life, after all, is not a meaningless episode. You notice? In the background, there's this question, if we all die, then what point is there? So let's work so that we won't have to die, that we'll get better and better. At least our kids will. But, as Sanford points out, this is a false hope. We need to be responsible stewards of the world which we have been given, but this is a holding action at best, and it's not a very good one. Sooner or later, we're going to lose the condors, but we're going to lose more than the condors. We're going to lose us if we keep going. We must look beyond evolution. Evolution is not the great hope. A reviewer once accused Stanford of being kind of like a sadistic steward aboard the Titanic, gleefully spreading the news that the ship is sinking. We're all going downhill. Yeah. No. Stanford hates genetic entropy. I do too. I don't like to see death. My profession is keeping people from dying. <laughs> but you have to face the facts that the death rate is still 100 percent. Um, pardon me. Um, <clears throat> does the reviewer not implicitly agree uh, about the Titanic? It's still sinking. Uh, it doesn't sink any slower. Because but we us pretend pretending it's not. Yeah, by us pretending it's not. <laughs> That's right. Only in the light of the bad news, if we know the Titanic is sinking, can we really appreciate the good news, that is, that there is a lifeboat out there for all who really want it. Right. And that's the essence. You see, there are people who don't want people to get in a lifeboat. People get in a lifeboat are no fun or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some objections that have been raised. Um, these are just three that um, have been raised a significant number of times. Well, one, maybe there's mega beneficial mutations, maybe noise can be averaged out, and maybe the failure of the primary axiom, that is the idea that, that with natural selection and mutation you can get bigger and bigger stuff and uh, you don't wind up getting smaller and smaller stuff instead. Uh, maybe that's not a serious challenge to evolutionary thought. Well, the uh, me mega beneficial mutations, the counter is, there's certainly deleterious mutations which are le lethal. The argument is, I should say, in these cases, a single point mutation can effectively negate three billion units uh, of information. Kid gets sickle cell in both uh, genes. Kid dies before having kids. In fairness, shouldn't the reciprocal be true for beneficials? Shouldn't the maximal beneficial mutation also equal to three billion units of information? It's not how information works. If you take a book and burn it, it is much easier to burn a book than it is to write it in the first place. Much easier. Beneficial mutations in a given environment sometimes can actually involve loss of information. A fly gets out to an island. The more of its offspring have stunted or no wings, the better off they're going to be because then they won't get blown off into the ocean. On islands, there are a lot of flightless insects, birds, whatever, that have learned to dispense with flying because they don't have to get away from enemies and because they're actually safer that way. You know, if you fly out and one day and it's windy, you're a goner. Homeobox gene mutations are a theoretical possibility, but the difficulty of getting just the right homeobox gene uh, mutation is kind of like 
winning the lottery multiple times in a row. Yes. Or well, uh, you want me to comment? I'll just say. Yes. <laughs> go ahead. I uh, I wasn't blind to say anything, but oh, uh, you were holding the mic up. I thought. Oh. Uh, well, but talking about homeoboxes, uh, uh, whatever you do with homeoboxes, this is very superficial. You got to alter the whole system beyond the homeobox in order for the new thing to work. Uh, You've you, got you, this is a very simplistic approach here if you're just talking about homeobox mutations. What goes beyond is what's so important and is much more complicated. Well, see, and that's, uh, of course, the whole point is that you have to have this mutation, that mutation, this mutation, that mutation, all at the same time, all in the same thing, and have a female that, or male, whichever, you know, that does the same thing so that the two can mate and actually... Uh, create uh, a new species or a new major type of organism and you, you're asking for winning the lottery multiple times in a row and, and if, you, if you're just changing timing you have to change the whole system when you're just going to change the timing uh, you know so you, it's easy to say well I'm just changing the timing man well, you try and change the timing and get success it's impossible almost yeah Darwin's not went over this, and I think pretty thoroughly, that you just, you can't do that. Not, in, not realistically. Not by random chance. Now, what about noise can be averaged out? Well, the problem is, first, the population size isn't infinite. You, the time, is, the noise is never uniform, so it, it's hard to average out. And the genome itself is actually changing. So you're getting the, the signal to noise ratio is going crazy. And noise neutralizes selection, so now you can't select for what you want. And finally, <laughs> there isn't enough time. And so between all of those, why uh, noise averaging out is just not going to work. There's people who do this have not put in the numbers and turned the crank and put in numbers that are reasonable, not for evolutionary theory, but for real life biology. The failure of the primary axiom is not a serious challenge to evolutionary thought. Well, there's only one actual evolutionary mechanism, and that's mutations and then either random spread or selected spread. That's the only way you can get evolution. And if you're trying to get something built new, random spread doesn't get you anywhere. Without that mechanism, evolution is not significantly different from any faith-based religion. That's why Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And if Darwin was wrong, then you're back to intellectually unfulfilled. Mutation and natural selection are, in fact, the linchpin of evolutionary theory, and there's a good reason for that. Degeneration is the precise antithesis of evolutionary theory. Instead of getting better, we are getting worse. And neutral drift, most importantly, cannot, that is, you know, stuff that, that really doesn't matter that much, doesn't matter at all. Well, if you're degenerating, it matters a little. Neutral drift cannot explain the appearance of design in nature. Mm -hmm. The whole point of design, as we discussed two weeks ago, the whole point of design was, uh, of, the, of a natural selection was, it f functions as a design substitute. It tells you why eyes look like they're designed when they're really not. Neutral, neutral drift won't get you eyes. Neutral drift won't get you anything. So if there is a failure of natural selection and random mutations, then you don't have an explanation mm -hmm. for things that look designed. Eyes, ears, fingers, brains. Now, my take is there are more than 70 mutations per generation in humans. You know, if you want to say some specific people it might get a little bit lower, maybe. Other people it's maybe a little higher. But certainly, 
the literature supports 70. The genome, in fact, is mostly functional. And that means that most of those 70 are impinging on function. And they're probably not doing you any favors. The vast majority of mutations are deleterious. Could I say it's actually for sure one in a million? Well, it's hard to measure. <coughs> but that's the best measurement we have. Natural selection simply can't keep up with all of that junk that's coming through. And that means that unassisted evolution is impossible. You're going to have to get something that actually plans. It also means that we're not long for this world. And it means that we didn't start that long ago. John Sanford went from being an evolutionist to not just being an intelligent design advocate. He went to being a short age creationist because of this. <coughs> you see, if it hasn't been five millions of years since we split with uh, chimpanzees, then that means that we didn't evolve from the same ancestor as chimpanzees. That means we're talking about a god who actually creates stuff. <coughs> what do you do with the evidence for long age in the geologic column? I'm not sure that Sanford can tell you. But what he can tell you is that the standard evolutionary theory simply won't work. And that once you've got <coughs> God involved in the process, then why do you have to have long age? Now, if I can kind of give you a parable, it's like watching a metal boat, you know, without air compartments, with a large leak. And it's being bailed out by a man with a teaspoon. And sometimes the teaspoon doesn't even throw the water out over the side. Well, there's several things you can say. One, the boat's not going to stay afloat for very long. And you can even probably calculate when it's going to go down. Number two, it didn't get as functional as it is right now by the man bailing it out because he simply doesn't have the power. If the boat's leaky, somebody had to have put it in the water in the first place. It had to start out, well, it didn't necessarily have to start out without leaks. It could have had leaks at the very beginning, but it had to start out without water all in the inside of it. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Here. I'll sure. Let's pass this on to whoever might want to comment. I just want to comment also that uh, you have to factor in the mutations in the corrective mechanisms as well. So the teaspoon's actually rusting as he's bailing things out. And, and the hole in the, in the <coughs> side's getting bigger. That's right, at the same time. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I, I would raise the question. Uh, in view of some of this data, uh, why are we still here after 6,000 years? I raise this because of uh, the suggestion, well, maybe we have 1 to 2 percent mutations, uh, uh, genome, degenerate 1 to 2 percent. Uh, that, that, uh, that cannot mean that uh, the whole genome is gener degenerating that fast. Uh, because, you know, that, that's one or two percent if you uh, add that up. You know, in 2,000 years, you've got 100 uh, percent at 20, 20 year generations. Uh, uh, actually, so no, not that, because that, uh, uh, ev even if it was sequential, it would be 100 generations. Yes. 
Well, a hundred generations is, is 2000 let's years. say, yeah, two thousand years. Uh, no. But it's it's an exponential yeah. thing that you lose. Right, you do go down. So, but the other thing is, yeah. you have to consider where we came from. If you believe the biblical mm. record, Adam had his third kid when he was one hundred and thirty years old, and then he had other sons and daughters besides mm -hmm. that are not mentioned. He had three kids that we know of. And sons means five sons minimum, and presumably at least four daughters, even if you're going minimal. Mm -hmm. And I rather suspect that it wasn't minimal. I rather suspect that he was like some of our fertile families now who have uh, 20 kids. And so we start out with a huge ability to have kids. And then what's happening is you're seeing, you're seeing a downward, uh, downward pressure on lifespan in general. And mm -hmm. you're seeing a downward pressure on uh, a fertile lifespan. Uh, you know, uh, <coughs> for example, Abraham and Sarah, nobody seems to have been that concerned um, because Sarah was, you know, talking about, well, maybe I'm infertile. Um, but she didn't actually have menopause till after she was about 86. So mm -hmm. you're talking about people who could have kids a lot longer than average. What, I, what I'm uh, getting at here in this is uh, if the mutation rate is so fast and there are, you know, 70 mutations per generation, uh, why is it that we are still existing after so many generations? Uh, we, we may be petering out. Well, I, I'd like to blame it all on the environment because uh, people don't want kids in Europe. But Europe is actually collapsing. Europe is an endangered species. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, there isn't a, something we haven't looked at here especially. Uh, we have neutral mutations. You know, I don't think there is such a thing as a neutral mutation, but, but it, it's in the literature, and, you know, and it's a bracket. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one paper I was reading fairly recently seems to suggest that, uh, well, maybe one third of the mutations are neutral, however you want to define that. Uh, one third are moderately deleterious, and one third are highly deleterious or lethal. And that is the account for a 25% miscarriage rate. And nothing uh, we do is going to change that. Right, but. Uh, the question I'm wondering is, is it possible that we have lived so long, and I'm talking about 6,000 years uh, as a figure, we're not sure exactly where that is, but anyway, talking about that, uh, because so many of these mutations are really not significant, they just, they, they produce the same amino acid, just a substitution that produces uh, the same amino acid in the genome and that uh, we have enough rubber here that we've survived, but sooner or later, the genome, you can't degenerate the genome too far before you run into trouble. But right now, we haven't run yet into serious trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, see, here's one of the things that could happen, <laughs> for example. Um, you can have a pseudogene that is mutating, and it's mutating at a faster rate than the average, um, you have a gene that actually codes for a protein. And the pseudogene is supposed to produce an RNA that interacts with, perhaps, blocks that RNA except at certain instances. And so what it's supposed to do is to control the regular RNA. Well, you mutate the pseudogene's RNA, and it doesn't actually code for protein, so you don't notice in the protein code. But what you do notice it in is it doesn't fit the regular RNA quite as well, or perhaps it fits it too well. 
And so now you have dysregulation one way or another, either up regulation or down regulation where you shouldn't, or perhaps allowing this thing to be expressed in brain where it used to be only in liver or something like that. Uh, so you could have uh, you know, mutations that don't look like they really interfere with protein synthesis, but they do. In fact, even the mutations in the protein synthesis one, the protein gets translated fine. Perhaps there's a subtle dif difference in the rate of protein synthesis, and perhaps there's a subtle difference in how well it is blocked by the pseudogene. So you'd like to say, well, no, it doesn't, you know, because it doesn't directly influence protein, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. But it matters for regulation. So we have to be really careful about that. Yeah. But is there, is there a factor of redundancy here that has preserved us? Probably uh, so. It seems to me it has to be in view of these figures here. I don't see how we've lived in 6,000 and, and like, years. You know, in the, in the yeah. space shuttle, we have three different systems that does everything. In fact, in, um, <clears throat> in airplanes, we commonly will have three totally different, totally different mechanical, different everything, uh, ways of controlling the, uh, uh, let's say, the ailerons or the, or the uh, tail flap or something, uh, so that if something goes bad, in one of the systems, the other ones can manage in spite of it. And we, we probably have all kinds of extra redundant stuff, which, by the way, is something that evolution would never put in because it only works when the other systems fail. Yeah, well, and it's very hard to evolve a redundant system. Exactly, exactly. Uh, we have another comment over here, and then I guess we have one up there too. Do we know that the mutation rate is a constant? We're pretty sure it's not. So could it have been slower? It could have been slower before. Raises a very interesting question of um, about the time that the human lifespan started to drop is exactly the time when meat was introduced into the diet. And it does raise some very interesting questions. Um, I do know that the longest lived non-exclusive um, human group happens to be one that does, in general, not eat meat. After listening to you guys, I sometimes am thankful to be simple-minded. So I have a few simple-minded questions. We breed animals and other things to improve them and have some measure of success. If Hitler had succeeded and bred everybody to be blonde and blue-eyed and whatnot, they would uh, have sunburned more easily. Would we, would we have um, overcome this entropy? And the last part is, and I hate to use the word, I don't understand it, but idiot savants have advanced characteristics could we have bred toward those things and improved the human race? Probably not. And uh, I mean, even intelligent selection, I mean, if you think about it, you only have so much selection you can use. And there's just too much stuff coming down on us. Even if you had absolutely intelligent selection as opposed to environmental where, you know, the guy slips into the glacier and falls to his death, which may or may not have to do with his genetics, may have to do with the fact that he wouldn't listen to his mother, you know, or something. Um, you'd still have that kind of problem. I, I don't think you can breed a su super race for the simple reason that one, there are too many genetic mutations. And uh, I mean, the best you could do is hope to have a quasi-holding action for a little longer. It wouldn't be a, uh, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a total stop. See, uh, and the problem with, you see, human beings have tried this in the past. Think about eugenics. 
think about blue bloods, think about caste systems and such. And in every case, whenever you do a subpopulation, uh, presumably because it is superior, what you're essentially doing is you're depriving it of genetic contributions from the rest of the population. Thus, you're essentially making the mutations go faster. For example, let's, let's pick the Jews because they're, they're more intelligent than anybody else. Now, maybe that's environment, maybe that's hereditary, but you know, one-third of the Nobel Prizes have gone to Jews, and that's, they're certainly not one-third of the population. So, let's put them all, uh, now what do you do with Tay-Sachs? What? Tay-Sachs disease. That's hereditary. Hereditary, uh, really, really a problem with, uh, with uh, Jews. They, so that's not the only one. They it's not the only. Oh no, there's a whole bunch of them. That's that's just picking one out that's well known. Or or the Amish. They also have all kinds of hereditable diseases. And the blue bloods are known to have carried all kinds of inborn problems. Uh, blue bloods are famous for having uh, hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Yeah. Queen Victoria was a carrier for it, and that's how Tsarevich got it. So. The answer is no. We're not going to get uh, we're not going to get this by very carefully designed uh, marriages, and and uh, it's not going to work. I'd like to just my comment. granddaughter. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so you haven't met my granddaughter yet. <laughs> <laughs> she's had she's stolen all the beneficial mutations. She's I take it. superior. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to comment not on the actual content of genetic entropy, but on the methodology of developing a dating method. Now, true, this isn't a dating method, but it has something to say about time. You know, that's mm -hmm. very, very obvious. Mm -hmm. It seems like all of, quotes the dating arguments that creationists use, and I've read all kinds of creationist literature, all the arguments have to assume a certain amount of uniformitarianism, right? Yes, the question was just asked about the, uh, the rate of mutation. You know. Is it constant? And the answer yeah. is probably not. Probably not. And so when you deal with things like the decay of the speed of light, for example, or the decay of the Earth's magnetic field, all you're doing is taking a little slice of time, namely a slice of time out of modern physics, however soon it, or long ago it started, maybe a couple hundred years, maybe 300 years, maybe 400. And then you want to extrapolate back to it 6,000 years, and your goal is not to let things get out of hand and go back 10,000 years. So we're, we're just extremely limited. You know, whenever we're talking about time and processes, so there's a it, tremendous amount of faith involved as well, with the other side too, with well, the long a, ages. Yes, if, yeah. you, if you're going to criticize us for being uniformitarian, I, I, and, I, and I agree with that criticism, it's, it's a mm -hmm. fair criticism, uh, then you have to criticize the other side in space. You better criticize the other side, that's right. Uh, Okay, yeah, I guess Ariel's next. Well, I, I would just uh, comment, uh, if you're going to be a scientist, you have to be in foreignitarianism. You have to be foreignitarian, and this is, this is the basic game. Well, but, but, you, uh, it, it's, but it's good to admit the limits of your uniformitarianism. Sure. And you can, always, you can always say, hey, this doesn't work, and so on, or this is less likely, and this is... But there are some factors in science that are so strong that... Uh, I'm uncomfortable saying, hey, this is just chance. Well, Lyndon Johnson uh, is famous for saying, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know he didn't get there by himself. Yeah. Uh, and I would, I would, uh, I would throw out... Uh, he didn't get there by himself. <laughs> he had help from water, from something. 
And I would, I would, I would throw out uh, rates of erosion as a, an argument, and you find it in both my books, uh, <laughs> related with that it's so extreme that I think we need to not throw it out as just coincidental. Uh, our continents are being washed away. They're being washed away at the rate of 61 millimeters per thousand years. You cannot put that on a long ages model and produce anything that works. For uh, cut it in half because of agriculture. Obviously, agriculture increases erosion, but uh, it's not half as bad as the literature says. But cut it in half. You still are going to have you're going to erode your continents away at least a hundred times, a hundred and twenty times yeah, over geologic time, and magnitude. they're still and they're still here. There's something radically wrong when you get in that level of figure uh, using uniformitarian data. The the, the, I, uh, the the boat the boat has a hole in it and it's sinking, and there's nothing. I mean, even if we got a huge machine, we probably wouldn't be able to keep up with it. I don't know if anybody's going to say anything about what's over there to your right, but uh, uh, let's let's uh, let's enjoy yes. it. Well. <clears throat> Um, I guess uh, that probably ends the talk for today. Uh, those of you who are interested uh, next week, uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, come on back. Uh, those of you, if, if there's anybody here who has not signed up for the uh, uh, newsletter, uh, let us know. We'll put you on it. Uh, I think most of us are here old. Uh, and... Um, and then, uh, and then the week after, we'll probably discuss paleocurrents. <laughs>